Mm, 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 mm. Alright. Okay. Uh, it's about 7 o'clock. We're going to this. I'll be right back while all of you get uh, settled in. I'm going to get my water and everything, okay? So I'll be right back. Okay, water acquired. All right, so we're going to go through the questions that you guys asked in my Instagram story. And since I'm still feeling a little under the weather, if I have to cut the stream, I'm going to try to shift it to something else like a commercial. But I don't know if it'll be a problem. So, boom, 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 boom. Um, let's see. Let's put on Photoshop. Scene two. Okay, let's move this back. I think I have it a little too close to my face. Bam, better. Rotate it. Ah. And just a little bit more. Maybe I should be doing this before the stream, right? Uh, okay, well, hopefully you guys are all in here. Let me post this on Instagram real fast. <laughs> live now this is the life of a social media person by the way live you got to learn all the little things that people like and learn how to manage this and actually be able to get everything done so okay we have tonight's theme is going to be the general theme is going to be female buddies. I am gearing towards making my pinup book and finishing it up. So I have had the pleasure of drawing thousands of female bodies. So over that time, I have learned a few things. And those are the things that I'm going to be explaining today. I'm going to teach you how I progressed and how I learned different things and how those things pretty much like geared how everything else was built um, and how I learned how to do things in shapes before I did anatomy and how that hurt me. So let's take out the smoothing on the brush. That's why it felt weird. Female body structures or just body yeah. okay so before we start I want to state something I am not claiming that any body shape is an ideal body shape and I am not saying or shaming or going to be saying anything negative about any sort of body shape that is not going to be the type of video that you're in I'm going to show you the basic way to create any female body from little petite to, you know, bigger woman. Doesn't matter. It's going to help you understand how to build the structure and then you can change that structure to whatever you see fit. I show you the building blocks and then you got to put them together in your own special way. Okay. Uh, so let's go on to youtube as well on my thing so i can actually follow along to help you and see the chat hey uh, we have king cobra hope you're doing good i'm doing a lot better than the last couple of days hey daru hi todd rod <laughs> hey daru it's isaac oh that's my that's my nephew Hey, what up? Uh, Hanif Mazuki, salutations to you, my good sir. All right, salutations to you as well. So, let's just set up this canvas so we can actually work on it properly. And now we go. Okay, so when we think of female shapes, it's just a basic human 
you know, if, human, if you had like a generic human, it would just be one that has slightly wider hips in a general sense. Not all women have wider hips. Please, I know the comments are going to be coming because every single time I talk about this, it happens. Please don't take anything as I'm taking as a generalization and just for the aesthetics of a drawing purposes for what is generally drawn for comics and everything like that. That is how I gear my drawing of women because I like pinups and I like, you know, making them very sexy, very, so very curvy, very thick, very, you know, like exaggerated. So please don't think that I'm like generalizing women into one thing and I understand that everybody comes in all shapes and sizes. So I'm just trying to avoid that conversation at the end. Uh, let's see. Robinson Fernandez, woo, two streams in a row, it is Christmas. Oh, it feels like it. But don't get too used to it because I don't wanna be sick as often as I have been. All right, so we have a general human, which is going to be represented as easily as having something like this. This would be like the little generic humans you see in like signs and stuff like that. Okay, that's a generic human. We're gonna have little hands. And he's gonna give you a thumbs up. That's a horrible. Thing. Thumbs up. There. Okay, so we have a general human shape. I don't normally like to break things down like they show you in like the Loomis approach and a lot of the other ways that I've, you know, studied. They never made sense to me. So I learned to structure my bodies in a slightly different way than most other people do. I started a lot with learning how to draw cartoons. Cartoons were exactly the reason I got into art. I did not get into art for realism at all, or comics, or anything like that. I wanted to draw cartoons. More so often, cartoons like... Uh, see if I can draw them from memory. Oh, man. I know he has a striped shirt. That's too big of a body. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes was my pretty much my reason that I started in getting into art, drawing in general. I thought to myself that if I could journal my life the way that he that somebody could draw a comic strip, regardless of how boring my life could be, it would be amazing because I'd be journaling myself. It'd be my own little comic about my life. So that's the reason that I started doing that. When I started drawing, period, like I did not understand anything about anatomy. So, for example, in the Loomis method, right? I think I think this is the Loomis method. I think this is like the most traditional way that most people break down bodies is with, you know, the cubes and the hips going as two boxes and then the boxes going to perspective and then the boxes this was just nonsense to me i didn't understand this i couldn't even draw a cube <laughs> you know i couldn't i did not understand the concept of three-dimensional drawing or seeing something as a shape i remember doing these doing this initial shape right here because I knew it was like a throwing star and then connecting everything with a triangle. And that was the closest thing that I could give you as an understanding as to how to draw a cube. And as you can see, they were horrible. So they were just bad. I was not drawing in dimension. I was drawing with lines. 
when you draw something, that should not be a circle in your eyes, unless it has to be a circle. If it's going to be an eyeball, if it's going to be a planet, if it's going to be anything with any dimension, you should be seeing this as a sphere. And this all plays into what we're going to be drawing. So just give me, give me a couple minutes to uh, let you guys know in a little bit more about like what it actually like takes to learn this stuff. Okay, so whenever you have anything with shape, you got to think about it as a three-dimensional shape. Right? It's going to have depth. It's going to have segments. It's going to have perspective. As you go farther back, the lines are going to get shorter. Depend you know, not, it's just basic perspective. With rounder shapes, you go around the shape around it as if it, had a, if it had a crust and you could only draw on the surface of it. That's how you got to see these shapes. If you're having a hard time doing that, seeing them or drawing that, spend your days doing this. And imagine that you're just layering on a big ball of rubber bands. all over it and then when you start doing that again all you got to do is draw the front of each one of those lines and now you have proper depth Ta -da! you do the same thing with cones you do the same thing with circles or spheres you do the same thing with cubes and then eventually you start learning how to do slightly more complex shapes the complex shapes are what constitute the human body. Our bodies are not just boxes. Having this, thinking like this, is what keeps us drawing very staticky robot-y things. You know, uh, because you can only move, you can only imagine how the body structures or the little bumps or every other muscle structure has to fit around the box we're not boxy we don't have edges we're more like blobs <laughs> honestly we're more like a pillowcase so what i started doing actually i'm gonna not erase things when i'm doing these lessons i have a bad tendency to erase things and Probably shouldn't because I can use that material for later. Uh, what I learned very, very early, and that's um, map. Skip this out because I still want my basic generic human. There we go. Okay, so we have our generic human. What I learned to understand is that if I started to draw things with my head, if I, the, the head was the first thing I drew then the body would always be either too long or I make it too short so it looked like an anime character and whenever I tried doing the whole proportions thing you know like bum, 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 like two heads down is the chest blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh, let's do it again. whatever whenever I started with the head Horrible. That's really horrible. I never got the proportions right. It just never worked for me. So I just started drawing things from the body. And I was like, well, it's the biggest part of the part of the human or the body. So why would we not really have that? It has only two parts that well, actually one part that moves, which is the spine and the chest. And the hips are pretty static. So, what's the best shape to represent that? And what I came up with was a beanbag. What I honestly consider to be the ultimate shape when it comes down to drawing characters. Any drug queen? 
the bean bag and I made a video about the bean bag if you guys want to learn a little bit more I'm gonna explain it a little bit right now because it's gonna come into play when we're drawing our, uh, our, our female shapes and but take a look at it it's actually one of the most interesting videos that I've done about drawing bodies because you can do everything with this little bean bag shape and I'll show you guys how so you have your little bean bag now the upper part of the bean bag is going to represent the rib cage. The lower part of the bean bag is going to be the hips. Now, when before you start doing the hips, though, I like to map out which direction my whole body is going to be. This is a very fun shape as well because, let's say, if I wanted to make it looking up. I start with where the rib cage, bottom of the rib cage is, and then I start mapping everything out from there. So now I have my sternum, which is the front part of your chest. Uh, I think the sternum is right here. Then that sternum takes me around the shape. This is the rib cage, remember? It's going around. That's going to be where the shoulders are because that bone literally goes to where the middle of your shoulder is. And that's why learning anatomy is good. You, you learn landmarks. So that and that connect to where the middle of the shoulder is. The shoulder is connected to the chest about the middle of where your clavicle to your shoulder is. So as long as you have that, now you have two different measurements that already map out all the entirety of the top part of your body, right? Now, depending on what you want to do with your hips, you just trace a line going around the sternum. It's going to give you the spine. The spine is going to determine where your hips are going to go because they connect to your hips their hip bone at the end where your tailbone is. So in this case, let's say that I want it to be having, you know, let me fill this in so it stands out a little bit more. I want the hips rotating. So the two parts right here are going to be where my legs are. I like to mark this area like that by drawing underwear on my bean bag. and pretending that it's going around. Yes, this is how I think. <laughs> right? So now that underwear or bikini line that you want that you drew going around your shape is going to provide you where your legs are going to come out from. And then you can always draw the front where you connect the middle of your bikini line to the middle of your sternum that you drew before. And now you have your abs. And you know how your stomach is supposed to go and your hips. Because that beanbag shape provided everything. Now if we clean this up, let's say... We go back to our basic sketch, which is still mapped out like that. We can just trace over the lines. And then we have Pretty darn fun anatomy, man. Like it's, it might not be a hundred percent accurate, but it's pretty close. In uh, at least for our art purposes, it's pretty, it's pretty consistent. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, let me know in the comments right now um drawing what up uh while i read this oh so you guys can catch up okay uh, 
Robinson Fernandez Jr. Bugs Bunny was the reason I got into art. That's awesome. Uh, let me move this over here for a second. If it starts dying, then I'll move it back. All right. So, Blaze Akuma. Hey, Rodgan, today's my birthday. Okay, Blaze Akuma, since it's your birthday, I want you to determine one aspect of a female body that you would like me to focus on. You have about 20 seconds to respond, though. Okay? So put it in the comments. Um, Nightshade. Hey, brother. How's it been? Been better, but doing great. Uh, Blaise Akuma again. Gonna finish watching your stream. Uh, Suba Gupta. Hello. Hedaru Rod. You should try to stream on Twitch and YouTube at the same time. The next stream. Announce it on Insta or something. You know, it's something that I've been wanting to do, but I just don't know how to actually set that up. I haven't had the time to study that. Um, Hedaru, you should try to stream on Twitch. Hedaru looks pretty solid. Hedaru, realistic. That's an incredible drawing method, Ragan, and it's very easy to understand. Legs, perfect. I will focus on legs for you, man. But let's uh, continue. So having that, let me show you guys another example. I'll do another one based on this little little guy right here. We'll call this one. Okay, so if you wanted to draw, let's say, a very different type of thing than a realistic thing, you could always change the proportions of this. Maybe make the rib cage tiny on the top. make the legs gigantic give the underwear and then you can have a very stylized character See what I mean? It doesn't have to stay within that realm of that, but having these simple ways to break down the shape of a beanbag into absolutely everything is something that is very valuable. And that's something that I've been trying to put together for my lesson for 21 Draw. I just haven't mastered the way of explaining it yet and it's taking me a little bit longer than I wish uh, so they're probably a little frustrated with me but I want to make sure that I release good information because I'm not hurting for the money it's it's not about the money for me like at all it's about like making sure that I'm putting out quality stuff for you guys to learn from because like I don't want to have to like you know I just don't want to have to, like, just do a lesson just to do a lesson. I want to do a lesson that I know is going to help a lot of people. That, that's the goal. Uh, if you wanted to have this character not be a chibi character, you can always just add legs. <laughs> just add the extra part. And then now you have a real pinup. Or a little chibi thick woman. Maybe bring the hips up a little bit and then ta -da! see what I mean? It's very very easy to turn this basic shape into a bunch of different things. Let's try one more. Um, something that you would not expect. Hmm. See, now I'm throwing myself into a loop. Um, yeah, you can make monsters. You can make everything out of this. But we're talking about female shirts. You can make any, any shape from this. Let's say that if you actually made this into a wider shape. 
maybe not so conventionally just bean baggy, but just give it a very wide bottom. And it also doesn't have to have the crevice right here, like at all. Let, let me let me clarify that right now because th that's gonna come up. That's gonna come up with uh, a lot of you, and they're gonna have trouble just drawing it outside of how I'm explaining it. So I'm gonna draw things in different views. So this is a very simple shape to turn around. This is another thing that somebody asked about as well tonight. If you want to have something from a lot of different views. You do what I would like to say a rudimentary turnaround, right? You map out the little tiny parts of your drawing that are guides as to aspects that would change as your face turns. And then you are able to draw those in different sides just by transferring the lines and the details to the next section. And of course, you have to adjust for perspective. If something sticks out from a profile side, it's going to be farther out into perspective. And what happens when something pops out into perspective? It gets bigger. Right? Good dunk, good dunk. Okay, so that applies to when you're drawing women with big booties. So if you have a woman that has a booty, right? That's probably a, uh, there you go. Okay, so we have a lady with a booty. Now you wanna draw that from a profile, but if we wanted to draw that from the back, We have to account for that. So we're gonna apply the same method. We're gonna map out the points in the drawing. That's where the hips come in. That's where the butt starts coming out. I know that the hips widen at the widest where your bone is coming out from. So it's around right here. I know that the hips are more so a shape like this, like a little heart. So I can kind of fix that into the drawing. And then I know that the booty is going to have to cup in because it's a significant size. So it would create a shadow too. And then everything else would just apply from there. But if we start thinking too, too, too complex of a shape like that, it gets a little bit more complicated. So I like to simplify it into a beanbag shape and it just makes it easy as, as pie. This is going to be the same view from the front and from the back. All right, so that's gonna be the back. I'll just indicate that and then I'll erase this to make it the front. Ta -da. Okay, so when you're drawing the body in the little peanut shape like this, let's zoom in a little bit more. The first indicator from the profile would be to draw again the middle of the rib cage, the little part that goes up like Feel the middle of your ribcage, feel that drop. That's what I like to draw first. So that will indicate where the bottom little point of your middle of your ribcage is. And that's important because that's going to indicate where contact with your hip would be. It's very, very close. So from there to where the hip, the top of the hip bone is, it's not going to be very far. So it's going to be in either of any of those directions, right? So it's gonna be relatively close to there. So that's why that's a very important landmark. That landmark can be transferred to the other drawings. Boom, boom, boom. All right, so 
for here the rib cage actually has a tiny bit of flat but i don't like to really indicate that so i'm just gonna draw a general shape and that's that high that's okay then we're gonna fixate on where the sternum is which is the clavicle sorry the sternum is this the clavicle is right here hmm. clavicle sternum uh. I'm not a doctor, <laughs> okay? Uh, so that little part of your neck gets mapped out on all three of them. And then from there, you map out roughly where the middle of your shape is, and that's going to be the connection to your shoulder. Connection to your shoulder. You can always close out the shape for the rib cage by drawing back. Okay. So now from that point on, we can color code it so that we can follow this along a little bit easier. So once you map out your rib cage, Okay, so that color is the rib cage. Now we're gonna move on to the hips. So the hips, just draw a thong on your bean bag. That front part of the thong is gonna be your hip bone. As it rotates around, it's gonna be the top of your hip muscle and it's gonna go into the top of your butt. And then it goes around and it goes to the other side. But this area right here that you get is the general area where your leg is gonna come out from. So let's give this guy a thong, a high thong too. That's roughly where I mapped it out on that side. And it wouldn't go so far up. The highest peak is roughly in the middle of the shape, so it'd be right here. So it's more going towards that upper part. If you're seeing it from the front. And from the front, it drops all the way down here. So it goes from this side, because that's there. It's all about just mapping, mapping it, and then just translating that to the other shape. And that's how you normally draw these things in you know different shapes ways or sizes all this can apply to every character you can do this to a character's face i'll do a quick demo for you right here let's say we have mr let's make it very very quick and simple We have Big Eyebrow Joe. Big Eyebrow Joe has a big smile. And very little ears. Uh, little ears. Okay. This is Big... Big Joe. Now, if you want to make Big Joe into a profile side, we just follow guidelines to the most landmarks as you can get without it getting too messy. Obviously, creating perfect lines is probably ideal. <laughs> and then just start slowly mapping up the character based on those guidelines. If we're gonna go profile, you can get the general shape of the profile and then refine it. The nose is right here. So it'd be about right here. 
the mouth, I know that the mouth comes up a little bit and then he's going up to roughly where his eyebrows are. So it's gonna be around maybe right there. So it goes all the way up there. Cause I'm thinking of this as a three dimensional shape, remember? Then the lip goes down and this bottom of the mouth is around right here. And I know it's gonna angle down because the jaw pivots so it moves back down. All these little things uh, just add up. All the little tiny tutorials that you read and do and stuff like that, they just add up over time and eventually everything starts clicking. Uh, okay, the teeth. It's a lot bigger lower teeth. And then the jaw goes from here and the chin is right here. But it doesn't seem like there's much thickness, so that's why we take that angle. Okay. If we draw some lips, we can draw some lips right there too. A divot. That's what that line indicates, that divot. The nose is right there. The eyebrows go from where the end of the mouth is to where the nose is. But it's within these guidelines, so. The eyes are closer to the middle the nose and more so like that you end up drawing a character and then refining it until you get to exactly what you need a lot of the times the styling of one character doesn't really translate to a, a side view or a profile view as well as we would like so we have to start changing things up a little bit and make it work right But that's generally how you go about doing tournaments. Draw feet too. Well, not if you ask like that. You gotta be nice, man. You can't be demanding things. I don't respond well to demands. Uh, I do enjoy people asking nicely though. Uh, hola Rod. Juancito desde Argentina. Perdón si te saco del tema, pero ¿qué hace un artista un artista? Okay, so in case you guys don't understand. Hello, Rod. I am Juancito from Argentina. I'm sorry if I'm getting you out of the theme, but what does what makes an artist an artist? Huh. That is quite the philosophical question. Eh, let's answer it with doodles. So... What makes an artist an artist? What makes an artist an artist? Boom, boom, boom. Let, let's break this down and actually make it into a, like, a, like a philosophical theme. A little break, you know, from the drawing part. Uh, what makes an artist an artist? So. Let's look at the two ends of the spectrum. Somebody that wants to be an artist, a newbie, and an expert at art, an established artist, or established. Somebody that has successfully been anyone. So this guy right here is gonna be represented by Timmy and Timmy does his hair super clean, but he leaves the other side messy because he doesn't like being told that he can't, right? But this side is like super, super smooth. And he has like a bunch of cool things that he's drawn and he shows people. Right, that's Timmy. Brand new to art. He loves drawing just because he likes drawing. And he is unencumbered by anything that anybody else has to say about it. Okay, so he has no cares about industry. <laughs> just likes drawing. 
and does not how do I explain this when you start doing art you never really expected to to take over your life as much as you think especially when you make it into a career like you just enjoy it so pure joy boom that's the only way i can explain it. right so then we have all the way on the other side of the spectrum boom, boom. artist or designer or illustrator <laughs> illustrator or engineer oh wait it's not yeah architects engineers uh painters writers sculptors video editors and the list goes on actors blah 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 you know there's a lot of different fields that are considered art let's focus on the ones that only matter in our industry okay because you know if i start talking about like if you know like that those random dances that people do like I, I don't understand it, so I can't be a judge of it, right? I can't say it's not art if I don't understand it. Oh, that'd be just ludicrous. So let's focus on the ones that are most important to us, our, which are designers, illustrators, and painters, drawing people in general, graphic designers. You know, all those over time most of them will know how to draw or how to create a little bit of the other person's art. It is very, very unlikely that a very established artist didn't go through a plethora of all these to get to which one they want. So what makes an artist an artist? Getting from here to here is what makes you... A phenomenal person the love for it love for art to me is a very significant factor in it because for you to be able to get to where you're making a living with art you go through a lot of <laughs> you know like you go through in the innocence that this little Timmy has till when he gets to his established career path comes with a bunch of landmarks that can possibly stop you from wanting to do this you grow up then you become socially aware of how other people perceive art fields and that normally happens around middle school and high school when people start preparing to go to college that's when people start getting nervous about showing their artwork to people they start hiding in like the fact that they want to do art because, you know, their friends are going to be going to college for law or they're going to be doctors. And then you don't want to be pressured to not be able to pursue what you want. So you tend to, you know, hide your true, you know, like love for it. And then when people do find out that you do art at that stage in life, either you get accepted which is fantastic but more often than not people are very mean at that age you know especially if you're not a popular kid and you actually use your art as a seclusive thing it ends up being relatively bad experience so a lot of people tend not to show their work to people 
getting past that barrier high school middle school and let's draw somebody over here <laughs> He wants to be an artist or insert anything photographer mangaka a lot of people make fun of people that want to like work in anime like it's just weird like it's just a different type of art it's no less than any other shape so this is a big barrier that if you still want to do it after this you're an artist to me. Like, you're an artist from this stage. <laughs> from the very get-go. But when you really can say, I'm an artist, is when you break from here and you decide on a career path. This is the, the moment where everything changes. Because at this stage, you either go to college... Or you do your own thing, right? You either go to school for it No, Timmy here, he's in graduation, so he's gonna have his hair come down um, Timmy, he's gonna have glasses <laughs> Just because I have glasses so Timmy graduates from college. With his diploma. Okay. Or little Timmy decides to do his own thing and become an entrepreneur freelancer. Which means that he doesn't necessarily have to follow anybody else's rules. So we'll give him a mohawk to represent that. I always wanted a good mohawk. Jesus. I always wanted to have a mohawk. I had one very, very, very little. And it was towards the end of the time where my hair was actually my hair. So... Uh, my hair went away very early in life. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to have this guy with a mohawk. And let's see the different paths that people can take in each one of the sides. And what's the best course and, you know, why this is such a big barrier to cross as well. Because this makes or breaks you. This makes or breaks you. This makes or breaks you. And then there's even... There's one more that's very, very important as well. But that's the last one. And I think that if you can manage to break that one, it's uh, you're golden for the rest of your life. I think that's, that's a point that I broke. So you guys will see me here for a very long time. All right, so so now we have these two guys, the school or the freelancer. All right, let's uh, read some comments first. Hello, um, uh, Twancito. Clavicle is the collarbone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you practice still? I practice every day. I'm practicing right now while I'm doing these things for you guys. Um, as I explain things, I remember things that I've been, I learned a long time ago. And as I try to explain it to you, I'm learning quite a bit myself. Like I see myself getting better by teaching all of you. So I want to teach you guys more so that I can discover more. <laughs> so it's not necessarily all just like me giving. I'm actually learning a lot from this. I'm learning how to talk to a camera. I'm learning how to stream. I'm learning how to sell my things. And in that note, 
This all is brought to you by Coffee Break Doodles, the art of Rodgon the Artist, which is now available for print or digital download via my link on Instagram. Follow my links for more. Or just go to Rodgon the Artist on Instagram. Go to the bio. You'll see it there. And on top of that, you get a free coloring book, an activity book that I put together for people a very long time ago. So go get yours. All you need to do is put an email and that email will be used to send you guys really fun, cool things that I have planned for the future. So, and sometimes exclusive. So uh, I recommend that you go get your free book and have the possibility of getting free things down the line. So I don't know, seems like a win-win situation to me. Uh, okay, so yes, I do practice though. Uh, Shiba, hope you're feeling better, man. Been studying your drawings. I see some improvement in my own drawing. I still can't draw my own stuff yet. Having trouble drawing different styles of hair. We'll go into that later. Um, okay, so freelancer in school. The scholar, upon his path, if pro con. Boom. Pro. Con. Because it's not all just bullet points of good things. The pros of going to school is that you learn quicker. Because it's instructed. And if you have good teachers, then that's going to accelerate your learning path so much. That is why I do these things for you guys. <laughs> I wish I had a team. I swear, if I had the ability to create a campus in the funding, I would just... Uh, imagine Rod Gone School for, uh, for living as an artist and not failing. And doing other things that are really cool. How about that name for my school? <laughs> like Zoolander. Uh, when you go to school, you learn quicker because you're instructed. You're normally very focused on it. You're surrounded by like-minded people. You have access to equipment that is very expensive in software as well, thanks to your tuition. And you have the ability to learn from other students, which, well, learn from others. The con of being the scholar is that it's not that challenging. So it's hard to push yourself to the points where you need to. So, because art is very subjective. So a lot of art schools tend to go either one of two ways. The one that I went to was the Academy of Arts. And, oh no, I went to the Art Institute of California for my undergraduate. I literally learned more from every student there than I ever did from the teachers. A lot of the times I was teaching classes alongside the teachers. <laughs> and I wasn't even that good then. So, yeah, it's a... The con can be bad teachers or curriculum. You know, uh, we did not get taught how to survive. We didn't learn about contracts. We didn't know about taxes like on our bracket or how we have to file things. We didn't learn about how to negotiate or deal with freelance work when we can't get a job, you know? So the learning is limited to what can get you employed. You employed. And by employed, I mean hired on by a company. If you are not hired on by a company, 
then then you really end up not knowing exactly what to do because no one teaches you that like it i don't know any curriculum that i've visually inspected from well at least all the art institute ones don't have that or didn't have that at all and i know that because they invited me a few years later like five years later to be one of the people that helped them with their curriculum and ah i wanted to teach at my school <laughs> but they didn't let me shame on them they closed down mm -mm -mm. bad 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 ai but that's something that can happen. I don't think my degree technically counts anymore. Huh. <laughs> but I never used it. I never got a job because of my degree. So that's going to be on this side. So, and also, you only get what you put in. Now, if you're a very driven person, that's here. But if you're not, this, that, that one makes everything else not worth it. If you do not put work in during those four, four, three, four years, depending on the school, three to four years, if you do not utilize that time to learn, absorb, and understand the entirety of your industry, you're going to be in the same boat as him, but with $100,000 in debt. And that's not what you want. So don't do that. If you're going to school right now and you see yourself... It's, you're going to art school. You're not going to art school to have fun. It's fun, but the goal is not to have fun. The goal is to push yourself so that you get as good as you can so that when you get let out into the world, you can survive. Because this is a cutthroat industry. And if you do not know your way around it, which you have all the resources for that you paid for considerably if you don't do that you're just going to end up in debt and miserable for a very long time because this is not an easy degree let me state that hold on hold on this 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 requires a little bit more than just uh okay all right, let, let me shift my camera here so I can see you guys directly. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why it's important to put your all into the things that you do. And this is especially going to be focused towards people that are going to art school right now. I was, I was very, very bad about focusing in school, but at the, yet, at the same time, I wasn't. Yes. I was always playing Magic the Gathering, I was playing video games, but I was also drawing about 16 hours a day and then going to class for another four to eight hours a day. And I, I'm not saying that I'm any good, like I, the way that I did it was horrible. I overtaxed my body. I swear to God, I probably aged about 10 years in four years and it was just an incredibly stressful situation for me because I wasn't as good as I thought I needed to be to even make it into a remote job. I was horrible. I was bottom of the barrel. Bottom of the barrel. Every class. Slightly colorblind. And on top of that, not fantastic at computers back then. So, great. I went into a computer animation degree not really knowing or understanding anything about art or how to draw well i'm not the only one that does that and unfortunately out of the four or five hundred people no, it was like 300 people that were in my class only about 150 got to graduation 
most of them either shifted around like you know people that just came in thinking it was going to be a very easy degree like oh it's graphic design anybody can do graphic design or oh it's just animation all you do is draw that's the mentality that a lot of people have back in my day and i sound so old by saying it like this i sound so incredibly old but about 20 years ago i joined art school and back then we had to draw everything by hand and scan it with a very bad camera a security camera and then sync everything and then like doing the pencil test and then it was incredibly tedious right we didn't have equipment we didn't have wacom tablets we didn't have cintiqs we didn't have good computers so everything was very hard and driven by just hand skills i didn't know how to draw so my limitation wasn't the drive it was the inability to actually have someone teach me how to create what i needed they would assume that I understood volume of shapes. They thought that I understood shading. But for the most part, I only understood how to replicate how I saw somebody else do it. I was a very good copier, and that got me very far. But I was always at the bottom of the barrel because I never really understood how all these people that understood perfectly how to shift the character, how to mold it, how to make them look differently in different directions, I remember seeing my friend Alex Julian, which still is a very, very prominent street artist down in San Diego, California. He one day just randomly sat down, opened the sketchbook and started drawing heads in different shapes. And I'm just going to do that exercise right now with you guys. So you can see that like what fascinated me so much. And that's just a side note on the side note. So <laughs> eventually we'll get back to it. Okay, we'll get back to this one. I'll mark it as red and then we'll get back to that. <laughs> I always end up deviating. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, let's read some comments before we shift gears and then go back. Uh, Marina Bonaire, I wake up in France and see you're streaming. Good way to start the day. Yes. Uh, five tails. You should do your own NFTs. I'll probably buy. That is actually coming. Uh, I'm launching them through my Night Terrors brand, and it's gonna be just. I need to very, very much understand everything. If any of you knows the whole process, and is willing to share a little information with me, and help me out, please contact me through Instagram. I would be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly thankful because it's something I really want to get into. And if I can manage to make a living doing this and just be able to create all day, woof, man, I don't know how to, what I would be able to create. Entire worlds, honestly. Uh, let's see. Do you uh, Do you think it's possible to become a good artist when you start late? Like, I'm 33 with two little kids at home. I used to draw a lot two, a lot of three years ago, but right now it's hard to find time. Marina, yes. You want to know the formula? There's, it's a very simple formula to get better. Every day with even, like, Rod Gon's method. Okay, I'm going to draw myself. I think this will be better than the exercise with the face that I was talking about. It's a better sidetrack. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Rodgons. <laughs> okay, so Rodgons formula. I feel like I'm writing out like the atomic uh, bomb formula or something like that. 
honestly, write this down though. Like, I will only share this in this stream. This is stuff that is going to be in my book. And you guys are farther enough, farther enough in the stream that I don't mind sharing it with you. Because you guys are the fans. My handwriting is garbage. <laughs> Formula for accelerated growth with your drawing. This is something that I teach to every single one of my apprentices. This is the first thing that I try to impart on them before they continue doing anything with me. And this is something that I've seen personally help like make their art so much better so quick. And Corey, if you are watching this, I'm talking about you, bro. Uh, you drastically got so much better and Holy sh moly, dude, like, you're, like, ready to do your own comic. Like, you came to me wanting to learn how to draw faces a little better, and now he can draw his own comic. That's fantastic. Okay, so, Rod Gunn's formula for accelerated growth. Step one. Always carry around the sketchbook, right? Yay, little sketchbook. I like my sketchbook cover. I will always be thankful to Marianne for that. She definitely helped my career immensely by doing that for me. Because I don't think I would have drawn as much as I do right now if I didn't have that little sketchbook cover that honestly that that is what kept me going a lot <laughs> so carry a sketchbook with you everywhere you go ah, sketchbook now how i keep that on me the whole time there's a couple different ways now there's a fantastic fantastic product out there called the sketchbook wallet a sketch wallet the sketch wallet is a tiny little sketch. Like, it's, if I'm here, the sketch wallet is a little wallet. That has a little sketchbook inside. So you can draw. Anywhere you are. Even if it's the grocery store and you just want to sit down on the ground in the cereal aisle because, you know, you want to remember your childhood. <laughs> Sir, you gotta go. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so carry a sketchbook with you everywhere you go. That is step number one. Step number two. Draw for at least 15 minutes a day. At least 15 minutes. It does not seem like a lot at first. It really doesn't. But once you manage to find 15, odds are you'll be able to find another 15 throughout the day. If you're looking for the time. Right? So, find little 15 minute gaps minimum hey minimum in minutes is the same so min square <laughs> get it yeah. uh, uh, find little 15 minute minimum gaps and draw with this is this is this is the key factor well at least one of them draw with the 
intent of learning. And yes, that sounds silly as hell. Because we all draw because we want to learn better, right? We want to learn more. So we just draw and draw and draw and draw and draw and draw and draw. If I'm going to show you how that works and how most people don't do that. Oh, explanation time. Okay, so drawing with the intent of learning means that ah ugh. Oh, be. <coughs> oh. I hate sneezing. Okay. Drawing with the intent of learning means that you are taking that time to focus on a single thing you need to learn and that you're going to make sure that you can learn something even moderate in those 15 minutes worth of time, which means that you have to learn to understand what you're about to draw a little bit better each time that you draw it. Now, the difference between a person that drawing for drawing is this. A person that's just drawing to just draw will draw the same thing over and over. And it's not the same thing as in like the same pose, the same exact thing. It's literally imagine drawing a character like that. And you already know how to draw that perfectly and you're like amazing at it. But you keep drawing everything with the way that you already mastered. Everything is the same. And that's uh, something that happens a lot to all of us. We find a style that we like and then we're good at and then we stick to that. But when you are still learning, there's so many more possibilities than not a single stylized way of drawing. So you can keep that style and use that for whenever you're doing anything important because you already have that style established and you like it but you need to push your knowledge so that you can expand your brain so there's people that just draw and then just draw and then they draw and draw and draw and then that's all they do they just put the time in they're not really focusing on the mistakes they made they're not focusing on the details that could be better they're not using reference they're just drawing for drawing these people grow but at a very very slow pace because every single time they draw something wrong and then they draw it again they're telling their brain it's not that wrong you're telling your brain that's fine do it again do it again do it again that's going to take us to step number three don't draw oh i mean you can just draw to draw that's still going to be good practice don't don't let me take that away like if you're drawing you're drawing that's freaking great so i'm not going to put don't instead do this and I know that a lot of you, let me see if I can find some examples of my own stuff so I can, so I can just show you and so you can see what I mean. So we have a few old sketchbooks. All right. Okay. So this is going to be, all right, that's a good one. No, you the first page I opened. I used to take a lot of notes. Okay, there you go. There's two examples that I can play with right now. All right, so step number three. How do we put this? Be your own critic, revise your own, uh, revise your own work, or take notes and 
revise as needed. What do I mean by that? That seems a little weird. So what I mean by that is that when you draw something, all right, and I'm just going to draw something really quick. And I'm going to purposely draw something wrong. Okay, so a couple things that would be like off. There you go. Let's say we draw this character, right? And we're like, oh man, I kind of like some of the things here, but like some of the other things I don't. Uh... And I'm just going to redraw it. Before you go and redraw it, make notes to yourself. So if what I didn't like from this is because I wanted to maybe make this guy looking directly at me, right? So I'm like, okay, so this eye's okay, but this eye's kind of weird. So I will literally grab, like make a little line and be like, I is off. adjust to and then I'll grab if I'm using a tablet I'll just grab a different color there you go adjust to blue boom okay so the next time that I draw this or if I want I wouldn't change that if I'm I would leave that sketch like that I'll take all my notes first so that is the first note. The second note is maybe the mouth is coming a little bit too, like the chin is coming a little bit too far. So I will draw the right line in blue. And this is also something that I use with highlighter in, or with any, any accent color in my sketches. And I'll show you guys in a second. So jawline. Then I'll make the note uh, less messy jawline, cleaner shape, closer to mouth. Right, little notes. Then I'm seeing that the head right here is coming a little bit too far out. So bring, bring head. Yeah. And then the rest of it looks pretty okay. So what I'd like to do at that point is try to go in and draw the thing with the changes that you mentioned and see how different it comes out. You essentially become your own system of revisions and your own critic. So you need to learn that. Let's see, we have the eyes. Right. So now it's closer to what I expected. Boom, there you go. So now, next time that I draw this, I'm not going to make it, the likelihood of me making that mistake, that mistake, and that mistake are incredibly less. And this is like literally the secret to getting better quick. If you can do this, and now let's say I went to this one, right? And then I was like, oh, okay, this ear is a little bit too big. This one's sticking out a little bit too much too. It should be more like... Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So maybe the ear needs to be a little smaller so it achieves the look that I want. Or this eyebrow needs to be higher. So we bring it up a little bit to create a more dynamic look. From that point on, you just start adjusting little things like that. And 
as you keep going, you just end up with something incredibly better. And even if it's not something that was like something you could achieve right away at first, I promise you doing that with your sketches is going to get you really, really far. So here's a couple sketches that I have that I can show you guys. A couple pages. We'll flip through a couple. So I took advantage of drawings that were bad. And and I just would just chronicle everything that's wrong with them in a funny, comical way. This helped me considerably as I learned how to draw different shapes, different characters a little bit better. I am I was a very, very critical person of myself, especially when I didn't come out like the way that I want. I also see myself drawing a lot of things that were just literally drawing for drawing sake. But even when something good is happening, I just like to document things in my life. That was the reason that I got into artwork. If you have some plans for something in mind, you can also always write it down. You know, you never know when you're going to be coming back to the drawings that you have. Huh? So I've lost a little bit of this and I think that it's something that I need to go back to doing a little bit more. Because that's literally the reason that I got into, <laughs> into art. And we'll talk about that when we go back to the career thing. Uh, okay, so just more examples of notes and stuff like that that you can take. Accented colors to be able to create more depth. And a lot of repetition about things whenever they didn't come out right. Right? So, that... Let's see another notes. Ba -ba -ba -ba. So little things like that help you get so much better, so much quicker. You know, just examples. Little tiny notes like that will help you a lot. So that's it. It's a three step formula. If you do that, I promise you, if you focus and you only draw like this in your sketchbook for the next two months, Two months, if you don't see a gigantic change in your, like, in your designs and your art, I will give you a free Coffee Break Doodles book. I'll give you a free digital copy. But prove to me that you did it for two months and you didn't get better, I'll give you, I'll gift you gladly one of my books. Now, you might be thinking... One thing that I didn't mention here. What if I don't know what's right or wrong? Right? So that's why we use references. So let's say that I was drawing this and I was kind of like basing it off of the way that Randy Bishop draws faces. Right? Because I love Randy Bishop's faces. So I would like see where I got the idea for this and then use that as a reference to see how different it is from what I drew. And then you do the same thing. You adjust and you just have to focus on little details. There's going to be a point where you just can't see that detail. That's just our own skill level. It takes a while to get to the level of, of detail orientation because Think of it as tears. When you start off, oh, this is a completely different like tangent. So no, 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 we're not gonna get into that. Okay, back to the other tangent. <laughs> okay, so we're back to the, okay, what did we go over? Oh, how to get better quickly, because that was a question you guys asked. Yes, so you are able to get better after 33. I didn't start drawing till I was 19. I know that's not as old as 33, but there's no age gap for this. 
just because you're a little older doesn't mean you can't create any of the stuff anybody young is doing. Your brain doesn't work any different. I don't think that a person that's 33 is less capable than a person that's 20. If anything, you're more capable of learning quickly because you actually really understand what you want. So go for it. If that's something you really love, find a way to do it and go for it. And use my three-step formula to get to where the level that you need to to be profitable. And once you become profitable, then it just becomes fun to learn. Wow, this all like turned into not a female body stream. But uh, I think this is more valuable information, honestly. <laughs> and we'll finish up the female body shape so people don't leave bad comments on like that ever. I'm not going anywhere. It's Saturday. Uh, okay, so. I think we went over the school. We'll go back real fast over this so it doesn't have a lack of continuity. If you're going to, these are going to be what makes an artist an artist. That was the other question that you guys asked. So as a newbie, you're already an artist. If you like art, you're an artist. You slowly lose that during little stages if you allow it to. High school and middle school, when you get made fun of, when you don't get accepted for it, when you don't see it as something that you makes you popular, blah, 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 blah. That is one big indicator that if you drop it there, you weren't really meant to be an artist. Um, maybe you dropped it there, but then you pick it up later. Then you were meant to be an artist. The absolute stage is when you decide to make it a career. The two separate sides is a school. The pros, you learn quickly because you're instructed, you're surrounded by people that are like you, and competition as well. Access to equipment and, you know, well, you have access to a lot of connections. So, connections. Networks, socials, internships, stuff like that. So, that's a very big aspect of that. That's probably the best part of it. Now, the bad, bad teachers will often lead you to having wasted your time there limited time to get what you need to learn and most of the time that information is limited to what is going to get you employed by someone else because they don't have time or they just don't feel like teaching you how to survive on your own and you can only get what you put into this so if you slack off you're gonna have wasted your career if you work hard you'll have that success in some aspect of art field. Work your butt off, you'll get that. Slack off, think that it's easy, then you won't. Now, we move on to the freelancer side. Uh, I'm gonna need more space. Okay, so the pro aspect of being a freelancer is that you're your own boss. That is your own schedules, your own time, your own manage your own free time and work that alone is honestly a huge reason that is a plus in most people's eyes you get to do whatever you want get to do art you feel like doing it and i'm just gonna say it like that because we don't always this is an aspect as well that's gonna come next. And it's gonna deal with, um, I don't know if you guys know this guy yet, <laughs> but you will. Kudos to anybody who can shoot him out in, uh, before I finish drawing him. So this guy comes into play in the next in the next part um, because it happens to absolutely every single artist that does not get success before a certain time in their life. So, okay, so you can a pro being a freelancer is your own boss. You get to do whatever art you feel like doing. Uh, in the art field, we just do not always get to work on what we want because the money doesn't come from there. 
as a freelancer, you have the option to do work for others or to pursue your own your own art path. And that's a very, 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 very different path within that path. And that could go into a whole other video about that. A lot of people that go into freelance art, and I, I was to blame for that for a while. I would only focus on trying to get logos or business cards or posters or marketing stuff or mostly things that would help other people create their own ideas in their head. So I saw myself as a tool to be able to get everybody's idea onto paper and help them get like that. But that very quickly just drains you. Like whenever you're only working on other people's ideas, it drains you because you didn't get into art to create other people's logos. At least I know I didn't. Oh, I'm not even showing the screen. <laughs> oh, man, I'm so sorry. Okay, good thing is that we were just talking. Now you guys know suspense. And now you guys, if you guys can name this little dude, that comes up in the next stage. And that's literally if you pass this stage, then you made it for life. Uh, so all the pros are that you make your own path and you can pursue your own ways or you can just find joy in just making art and do art for other people so you could do printing you could do silk screening you could do production you could do editing you could do you know commercials you can do animation you can do all that stuff for other people to help their ideas come out and you can do portraits all that stuff is normally what i would consider client input material or client input funds or work you need to have in my opinion if you're going to go in this route you need to have a little bit of both you need to be able to You need to find a very good balance between your own art and your own goals and getting money from clients, which you are helping to refine those skills so you can get to your goals. So anything you do with clients should be refining what you need to, to get to that goal. So if I don't want to create logos for a living, and it doesn't involve anything in my goal path, I'm not going to take on logos. If I don't want to do comic strips or comic books, why take a commission for a comic book? Unless you really need the money. But that's also a problem. So let's go on to the cons. Oh, um... Let's go to the cons. If you decide that you're going to be a freelancer or a self-study person, Mr. Dup, yeah, John Gillen got it. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. So the cons of being a freelancer, you are reliable for your own self. Yeah, you have to be self-reliant. And even though that sounds like, oh, I'm self-reliant, I get up out of bed. That's not what I mean. You're going to be in charge of your learning schedule. You're going to be in charge of any, any source of information that is needed to get to your path. Because you don't have instruction. You don't have people that have been there. Unless you find a mentor or some sort of person that can do that for you. If you're on your own, you have Google and you have books. Those are your go-tos. And if you don't put the time into this, if you don't consider this part of 
a daily schedule, part of your job, you're never going to get better. You need to establish time to learn. You can't just keep doing art without trying to push yourself farther. Now, something that I like to think about is for people that are like employed and actually try to do their own career and path. If you have the ability to use your weekends to build the career path that you want your weekdays to be. That's it. Like you need, you, it's a different life. Being an artist is very different than many career paths. And that is something that I had like a lot of discussions with, with some previous exes, because th that's always been an issue with, uh, with people that date artists. They, they love the idea of the person being creative. They love the idea of the person, you know, having a lot of free liberty and will, but then when they realize that it doesn't come with a huge paychecks and it does not come with uh, a bunch of things that, you know, normally come with any career path. And even to us ourselves, sometimes we lie to ourselves, right? If your love language is money, this is going to be so hard on you. <laughs> Because it's so hard to make a lot of money. It's like, it's so difficult. Unless you are willing to do things that are not necessarily good to do uh, for a career path, you know? So, if you don't have the will to learn on your own, you're never going to succeed as a freelancer. Find a way to go to school. If you need a lot of people to tell you what to do, go to school. If you're able to get up at six o'clock in the morning, go to the gym, organize your schedules, tell yourself from this time to this time is this time. I'm going to take meetings from this time to this time. I'm going to research this from this time to this time. Then you will succeed as a freelancer. Don't go to school. Screw school. You are way better off. Do it on your own. But you need to be driven. And if you're not driven, this side, don't even think about it. Honestly, like, it's just not going to be a side of uh, art that you're going to enjoy. So you're not going to learn if you're not driven. It's going to be really tough on the scholar side, too. But it's going to be incredibly or impossible to do as a freelancer. Uh, it takes a lot, a lot of um, work habits, scheduling habits and learning to actually live within certain parameters uh, of, um, you know, limitations, because you have to constantly be spending time doing art and practicing art, especially when you're starting off. Like, it's insane. If you want to keep up with a lot of the people there and you're not absolutely the best, I was drawing about 24 pages in my sketchbook a day at one point. And these are full pages with the intent to learn my hands would hurt like they'd cramp up i i'm surprised i don't have carpal tunnel you know like i would do i learned to sleep like four hours a night and at the end of school i never ended up using most of the information that i learned from them so i was both and i am telling you right now whew, that was tough so I'm telling you all this from experience, from both aspects. You know, I was taught all the computer stuff at school, but I taught myself everything about drawing. So it comes with that. Now, the next and the last stage, the one that makes or breaks you is when you learn what the industry actually gives back. What it means to be an artist. So what makes an artist an artist? I still think it's the love for the art. But if you learn what it means to be an artist in this modern day and age, and you still like it, 
and you can live with it and you enjoy it. And what I mean by that is simply this. Bullet points that are very, very common. You do not get to do something for yourself for profit for a very long time, most of the time. So you need to understand, uh, you learn that your own ideas are not going to be your money makers for a long time. Bring money. Sometimes it just never happens. It's just part of it. Now, the other aspect of it is the monotony that comes with a lot of the work that is offered to creative fields. Oh, sorry. So let's say you studied illustration, but and it happened to me as well over the last five years, honestly. You're a person that enjoys drawing, but you end up at a job doing photography for a product company that imports things and sells them on Amazon. Oh my God. Yeah, I can do that because my skill set allows me to do that. But it was almost like my soul was being sucked dry. It was the easiest job that I have ever had in my life. No one supervised me. They just assumed I knew what I was doing. I did. Then in and day out, I would sit in front of a computer doing the same editing to all the same programs to the same images over and over and over again. I literally just wrote a script and I would get all my work done in like 20 minutes. <laughs> And then I just sit there watching YouTube for a long time because I didn't have anything else to do. That sounds like a magnificent concept and because maybe I could do my own work, but I couldn't. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to work on my own things while I was working at that place do just to simply not a smart thing. You know, never work on your own things on personal computers for businesses. Just don't do that because then depending on how you have your contract set up with them as an employee, they might own part of your shit now. Oh yeah. Mr. Depp is going to have a uh, little hands too. Uh, yeah. So even if it's an art field job, because it still is, it's marketing, graphic design, photo editing, manipulation. I hated it. I hate it. And I'm sure that there's so many people that would enjoy to do that and love to do that. But I would rather make $8 an hour drawing caricatures and be happy doing it than making the 30 or it was like $25 an hour that I was making at that place. Like it was just so bad. And I learned at that job, like that side of the industry. The marketing, videography, advertising side of the industry is not for me. It just is not. It's not. It's not. I, I will never work in that field again. I'm very, 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 very like close to not taking any more logo commissions. Because it's not something that I want to push for. I don't need a portfolio of logos. I don't need a portfolio of graphic design. That's not what I want to do. I don't want to take on people's commissions anymore like that. I don't, personally, I'm already having a hard time trying to find time for commissions in general because it just gives me stress <laughs> at this point in my, like my career, it just stresses me out that I can't dedicate the time that I need to them. So I just don't take them. And since I'm not necessarily in need of the money at this point in my life, I was able to push, well, push through. I learned what my industry is. I learned what I like from it. And I'm able to accept now that 
For example, I'm not an illustrator for a living yet completely. I do book editing. I help people edit kids' books. Books like these. So people deliver us artwork. In this case, it's my art artwork. But people deliver books to us, short stories, and I normally go in, I refine their artwork, I color correct it, I edit their story, I make sure that everything is perfect for their book. And I find so much joy in that, that I've been at this place for like two and a half years almost, and I have never felt the need to even find something else. And that has allowed me to create a lot more things for all of you too. So bridging this gap of learning and not being depressed and losing every interest in being in your field will allow you to find joy in some field or another and be able to do this for life. Until you are like me. Old because one day I will pass, but that day I will may have known that I chose my path the way that I wanted. And I live my life the way that I want it, as opposed to how other people thought their level of success would dictate my life. Right? So that's what makes an artist an artist. That went a lot longer than I thought it would. But uh, that's a very deep topic for me. Like, um, And this can be generalized into absolutely every single one of these fields. So this applies to being a designer, an illustrator, an architect. I don't know if architects and engineers can actually get jobs without a degree, but, um, but everything else, actors as well. That's what makes you an artist. It doesn't make you an artist if you're successful. Uh, you're, only success you're only a failure if you think you're a failure. Because you're an amazing person for being able to create things. Uh, well, this is live on YouTube. Okay. So, hello, sir. Good to see you. My question is, whenever I draw, I always did mistake between head, neck, and chest drawings. Can you please explain that? Yeah. Well, we're going to go back to our main topic, which is women and the bead magic. So... If you have not <laughs> kept up with this, because I kind of dropped it halfway in the middle. Uh, step one, create a bean bag. Wee! Little bean bag. In any way, shape you want to draw it. Just draw one big side of the bean bag and one little one, or the same, or whichever way you want. From that point on, you break it down into the rib cage. Uh, let's make this one looking this way. And then this one looking up. And then underwear for where the hips are supposed to go. Right? So that's where we stuck right here. Now, having that, how do we apply that to the rest of the body? Well, very simple. We just start sketching like that, and then we just loosely start building our character. So, let's say that we just, if you just want to make someone standing up, I'd like to make an action line first. Something that's going to follow the path of how the person's going to be standing. Uh, normally, a lot of people call this like at the action line and it's normally where your spine is supposed to go but i don't really see it like that like i see 
when I draw, I see more like like blobs. So that's why this method works really well for me. So I'll start with a bean, like a line to indicate like a path for my body. And then I'll draw a bean bag that kind of goes around that side. Like I know this is sounding very vague, but honestly, like I sculpt my characters. So I start, imagine this is like a big pile of clay. And then I slowly start molding it. The front of the rib cage, sternum, clavicle, to the rest of the rib cage. Now we're gonna give it underwear, but I wanna make the shape a little bit different. So I'm gonna make the underwear coming this way, which means that from here to the middle, that's where the belly is. And then I know that this whole section is where the thigh is. So I can make the thigh coming out. And if you saw the other video, you can see that everything is a bean bag. If you allow it to be. Um, we can make this leg coming out here. So this is the part of the underwear. If I do the other side of the underwear, it would be back here. Drawing through the figures is going to be a gigantic step in your career too. Learn to draw through the figures because that's going to save you so much, so much like stress down the line. So now we have like this little cool yoga pose. Bah, bah. Right? And then we can, in order to balance this character, if we were to go with this, these proportions, right now, the weight of the character is landing around right here. Because this, if I put a shadow down here, maybe it's not touching the ground. If I flatten this out, then it's more centered, but it's still gonna be around this area. It normally where the middle of where your neck is, that's more so roughly when you're standing up. No, I guess it would be more where their hips are. So it'd still be around right here. Now, if I know that the point of balance is right here, if I start adding too many things right here, let's say that I add like both arms coming this way, it's gonna look a little bit out of balance. If I draw like the arms coming this way, <laughs> it's gonna look like an interpretive dance, which is kinda cool, let's see that. So one arm going this way, and yes, I draw them like just stick figure arms at first. If you need to bend it, it's normally an equal bend. And the arm normally comes from where the shoulder and the clavicle meet. So you can have that generalization. It's normally pretty accurate. Okay. So that's normally how I draw arms. So oh, I don't think you asked that. <laughs> uh, then I start adding a little bit more depth. So I know that that's where the rib cage is. The shoulder needs to be somewhere. It doesn't disappear, so it goes behind the rib cage. We have our shoulder right there. Our shoulder leads to our bicep. I'm noticing right here that the arm is maybe a little bit too long. So I bring it in. And it's an overlapping shape. Again, like a beanbag. It's just a slightly different shape than a beanbag, but it's the same concept as a beanbag. And then the hand. Let's make it super drastic. Ah. And then this arm goes behind the neck. Shoulder, armpit, bicep, forearm. And this one will be a little bit different. Oh. Right, and I haven't even drawn the head yet. So now I start molding the character to fit the exact positioning that I want. And I start refining the silhouette 
to make it fit what I need before I even put the head in. Now, when I go in to put the head in, this is very important. These are the elements of the head. And I'm going to draw that here on the side. How does the head connect to the body? We have a human face. And we have our, our body, right? So if we identify a couple key points in the head, which is the side of the head, the cheekbone, if you can just identify those two aspects of the head, you're going to have a very, very much easier time indicating where the neck is going to be connected to the body. Let's just draw the quick mask method. So we have the rest of the face for reference. Now, we're going to establish where our clavicle is, because that's going to be a huge component when it comes down to where we draw our necks. The clavicle, middle of the chest, into the rest of the rib cage, right? If you take that little clavicle line, like little clavicle dot, and go to the bottom of your skull, a lot of the times it is wherever the ear is right behind the ear behind the jaw because the jaw overlaps where the ear is so all this area all this the ear is behind that okay so behind the jaw under the ear draw a straight line or a line depending on how your neck is if you're just standing straight it would be a straighter line from there to the clavicle. Now find your other ear by drawing through the shape, finding where the other ear would be, find that bottom of the ear, and then track that to the front of the... These are your two front neck muscles. Now the back muscles, well the back muscles connect from the back of your head, right? So if you see this in a profile view, okay. This is where the other one connected. Here's our clavicle. So this is where that one connected. It went to the neck. The other, that's the front of it. The back, literally goes around your skull and into your spine. It just follows your spinal cord. But a lot of people have issues with understanding how far in the head, back in the head, it actually happens. So this little tiny gap, it's not that big. <laughs> it just isn't like touch it like yourself. It's, it's not even that big. So don't overly enhance it. Normally, the ear comes after the jaw, and then there's a significant little space right here in the back. But when it connects to the neck, it's not that far out. It's like right there. Now, to complete that, you connect the skin from underneath the chin in a little curve. And then you shape that. Most of the time, it's just a shape. And then you represent that in the same way here. Now remember, these all have shapes. It's not just lines, remember? We're, we're thinking of things as a 3D shape. So what 3D shapes are we looking at here? Well, these are muscles that go around, they have a little bit of depth. And then these muscles right here, they go in and then back out. So 
So if you were a stickler for this, these would be slightly darker because they're caving in. And then these are a little bit less. So this part that's up here, it's caved in. This would be caved in. And that's how you draw the neck. These have shape. Boop, 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 boop. Right? So everything has shape. So that's how you connect the neck. So now let's connect the neck onto this little shape right here. Let's draw the head and everything. So if we know that the neck is going to connect from here, going to connect from here we want to how drastic like how drastic do we want to make the post <laughs> the arm is swinging back one thing i didn't mention is that the clavicle right here this one it adjusts depending on your arm so if your arm is here it goes this way if your arm is raising it curves around and lifts so it brings everything up right okay it's so just totally forgot to mention that. and the, but that comes into like a more dynamic like way of drawing then we can draw our head our head the way that i like to do it is if you scrunch up your shoulder if i scrunch up my shoulder it will touch my hair so when I scrunch up my shoulders in my drawing, that's where my ear would be. And then I can I already know that my ear connects to the jaw, right? So I can just start mapping out my character like that. Once you find one landmark, it's very easy to try to find the others. Ta da And we just go in and delete all the things that you don't need. And slowly refine your characters till you get a cool pose that you want. But that's how I would start with a uh, bean batch. Now let's do a couple, let's just sit down, talk a little bit, and I'm just gonna draw some female shapes, like some female bodies, and then walk you guys through the process. And then we'll cut at night, because it's already been like two hours or something. Hello, good sir. Now I just explained the neck and the chest. Detrás de la raya. La abuela dice que no sueltes el arte y sujeta fuerte a tus libros que sigo en México. The grandma says, don't let your art go. Hold on to it tight and hold on to your books and we'll follow you in Mexico. Aw. Jose Sanchez, love your book. It's awesome. Make me get into morning and draw. Yay! John Gillen, I think I've been drawing to draw up until I started watching your earlier tutorial videos. Well, hopefully you start getting a little bit better, uh, you know, at what you want to learn. That's... That's the goal. All right, so we'll start with bean bags, and we'll do bean bags with pink. Yeah. And we'll do bean bags in different shapes. All these will be different ones. So the whole point of the bean bag is also to create a lot of depth really quickly. So you don't have to worry so much about like all the base anatomy that normally comes with like <sighs> Alright, let's draw a head and then we'll draw 
eight heads and then I have to do the contraposta which means that one side of the body has to be angled to the other side dab 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 black I don't like drawing like that that gives me static drawings I like drawing with blobbies add a little element of randomness to it and it just makes everything better unique to a certain extent you know once you learn the rules break them all the time but learn them first do, 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 do. Please do share on live on YouTube. I mean, these are all live on YouTube a couple hours after I'm, I'm done with them. So, uh, I have been. Okay, and then we'll do some extremes. Doesn't have to be a perfect circle either. All these will be uh, eventually uh, like little pinups, mm -hmm. and you'll see how. Right. So we can call that. We can call that. A layer like that. And this one will be up. Okay, cool. Let's space these out a little bit, and then we'll just start. I'm gonna give myself space for the rest of the extremities. Since we're gonna go through them relatively quick. Come on. Be some light. How do we turn these guys into like female shapes with exactly the same methodology that we talked about right now? Uh, okay, Blue Devil. I don't do social media, EA, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Is there anywhere else that the fan students can purchase your art book? Or do you plan to make it available anywhere else? Uh, I do have a link for it. Uh, it just sends you to my stan account yeah let me let me just find it real fast and i'll write it out here um it's this really cool thing that i use it's kind of like um what do you call it uh what do you call it mm. it's a uh, link tree Enter part followed by what? Huh. There you go. No. Okay, so apparently I can't log into my, my stand. <laughs> but honestly, um, I'm going to try to put it on Amazon at some point so that anybody overseas can get it, especially in Australia because... It's so expensive to ship to Australia. It's so expensive. So I haven't done that yet. Like, I, I just haven't been able to send stuff over there. Which is unfortunate because I have a lot of fans over there. Okay, so we have that. Then we're going to make the rib cage in a slightly yellowish tint. This one will keep... Oh, that's not going to be bright enough. Let's go with this. Yeah, that, that one. So we're gonna do the front of the rib cage, the top of where the clavicle is, and then going around, creating this little, little tiny shield looking shape. And that's gonna be a rib cage for that one. And we'll draw the rib cage for this one. Hmm. Let's make it really, really small. And looking down a little bit. Okay, so we'll do that like that. Now, 
actually let's just finish each one before we move on to the others because then it just creates complications okay, so we have that we got to create some underwear depending on how we want our legs to be bending i don't like just drawing flat shapes for the most part but let's use this as a standard and then we can figure out the rest so i'm gonna give my little shapey some undies it's around now your butt comes well so now i know that within that little shape that's where my legs are coming out of so now i can draw some legs Use a little foreshortening to create the leg on the back. And a little foreshortening to create the leg on the back. That. The arms, I want to make sure that they look right. So I'm going to make one arm coming forward and then one arm coming back, which won't be seen. Shoulder connects to where the clavicle meets the rib cage at the edge of the side. Shoulder bicep, forearm, hand. Does it look familiar? Bean bag. Bean bag. I'm breaking it down into different concepts, but that's literally what the shape breaks down to, what the muscles break down to. One side that's more squishy, one side that's more flat. The other hand is going to be in the back. Her chest is going to be pushing up, which means that her rib cage is going to be coming in right here. And her hip bones are right there. Okay. If we scrunched up this, her hand is actually going down too, so we can move our clavicle down because it's going to be at the center of the rib cage, right? And then from here, if we scrunched it up, that's roughly where our ear would be. So we can decide to have our ear roughly around this area. And at that point, we get to decide how we want our face to be. From the ear to the neck, from the back of the head to the back of the spine, it's the back of the neck from the other ear into the neck. And that's for a more realistic thing, but it still applies. Like you can just exaggerate the dimensions if you want something to be more, more cartoony, more comic bookish. Add some hair at the top of the skull and then adjust our anatomy to make it as stylized as we need. So when you go in and you actually do your lines, that's when you can bring in the stomach, exaggerate the hips, make the thighs bigger, I'm just following the lines that I, I drew so the underwear becomes whatever costume or lingerie or whatever clothing you're gonna give your character or your top of your pants since we drew that in we gotta just draw the blue like the hip going in farther this is where the middle of the rib cage is so that since we brought it in we have to bring it in and it curves there's curvature to the ab muscles And then two shoulders and then from here when you're mapping out um, the breasts um, a lot of people just have a very weird misconception of how breasts are made or how like are positioned uh, since they don't really see the dimension they just draw circles it's very easy for them to you know not judge how big a breast is supposed to be so if you are seeing this as a 3d shape though you can map it out and then just create 
however big you need of a breast and knowing that it connects to the bottom of the shoulder and you make them um, as perky as natural as little as big or as however volume you wish them to be but it's going to be a little bit easier for you to create decent looking boobs if you understand that they're not just gigantic balls of fat. Okay. Then we're gonna follow the shoulder for um, relatively straight from that side, palm, and Super simple for now. Then we have our face. Okay, the neck is gonna come in. And then the other shoulder is going to be going backwards so gotta draw that going back and then the hair maybe the rib cage can be brought up to create more of a curve and that's looking pretty good well, not bad for a bean bag right <laughs> so that's just like a very outstretched pose like same in this case I'm gonna go for shortening the other way and then there's another approach that you can take if you get familiar with the shapes inside you'll start seeing shapes that just pop out from you and you'll be able to Kind of does it like a Rorschach, a Rorschach test. And then start seeing lines and like paths that you haven't been able to follow before. So a woman seen. Bottom. Started from the bottom, now we're here. All right, so that's two. That's... And this one, even though I approached it a little bit different, it still has the same concept within the bean bag. I just ended up using the entire shape because it just looked like such a clean shape for it, but. Rip cage on these that provide you with where the hip is supposed to go, and then the hip brings out where that leg is. Okay, let's go into this one. This one will just have a super long torso. But it's gonna be hunched over. So the rib cage is gonna actually go like this. And super long legs. But very like awkwardly super long rib legs. So that's my piece. Okay, so a character that had a body shape like this would probably have legs that go into a couple different directions. would be pretty awkwardly shaped because the thighs would be considerably larger than the rest of the body. So let's give them some caps or give her some caps. But I also enjoy drawing women with smoother lines than men. So I don't particularly like drawing very angular shapes when it comes down to my women. Some people are very good at it 
and they can create very 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 sharp edged weapons women and normally don't like to <laughs> the top of the underwear marks where the hip bone like kind of connects And then we can draw shoulders at the edge of where the clavicle is supposed to go. And never draw a flat shape going like up and down. As long as you just actively like consider that you don't want to have Oh yeah, maybe she's like a gothic girl. Scrunch here, scrunch here. So now she's gonna be looking down. And we'll give her some. Right, so that was a fun one. Uh, <laughs> okay, Deja Vu, Mr. Deb. Also, last stream you started to mention the wanting digital art. Oh, what I meant by that is they don't want to see digital art, or they they just don't feel like interacting with digital art. That's, that, I think that's more so the case. Uh, in this case, we're looking at it from the back. That's how I'm gonna assume it. So my rib cage is going to be going around this way. This one's gonna be a big lady. The undies of it, that would be one side. And it curves onto the front. So it'd be about here. Sometimes it's tricky going around like in certain angles. Spine. I'm not, since we don't map the clavicle at the back, we map we march we we map where the back of the neck would end which is the seventh vertebrae. That's roughly where your neck stops moving and rotating, right here. So I like to just kind of mark that and mark where the clavicle would be in the front. So just follow the shape and then find the sides. And that's roughly where that clavicle is supposed to go to. I know it just looks like a lot of scribbles, but in my head, I'm seeing all the shapes. So let's just start drawing. And I still want it to look womanly. So let's give it some hips. Because we know the underwear line is right there, so one of the legs can come in right here. Add some booty to it. leg and muscles you know have their own sides so you can work that in uh, this is the side of the body I'm gonna give her some hips and we'll give her some some breasts as well which would be coming out of the front the spine directly connects to where the head is supposed to go and then at that point you can get her get her looking back if you want so you can create a better pose and then you do the same thing you connect the bottom of the neck to the clavicle back of the neck connects to this which is already there and as you start filling out the rest of the shapes including the shoulders Ooh. 
Look at my long flowy hair. So as you can start seeing, you can just apply those elements to a bunch of different positions. Wait, what? Can you explain the foot of the foreshortened example? This one? We have the calf. The foot. Knee. Thigh. Butt. So this is the cylinder for the calf. It is going in an opposite direction as the one in the back. So that foreshortening creates a lot of uh, ease with, and it comes down to uh, creating a, an element. Uh, okay, so let's continue. Uh, this one, this one will be. Hmm, let's make the hips right here. No, we made too many like that. Hmm, let's go back to that. Done a lot from behind. So in this one, I'm just going to make her looking extremely up. Like it's gonna be extremely up to the point where you can't even see like her face. It's gonna, her face is gonna be like that. Okay. And then we'll make it super extreme with her legs are like doing like some anime, like extreme pose. So something like a Sailor Moon type of pose or whatever. So we have our underwear. To our bean bag, we have where the middle of our underwear is to the middle of the rib cage is going to be the line for our abs. The edge of this little point is going to be an indicator of where our waist is going to be, because our hips will collapse into that little section. And then from that point on, we figure out the rest. So if we were gonna push this to the extreme, I wonder if I should have done, yeah. If I'm gonna push it to the extreme, I need to change perspectives here. So the underwear normally would, you know, like just curl up. But since I wanna push that perspective, I'm going to go around the shape and then I'm going to really draw the legs going back down, like to the point where they're like super foreshortened. Right, so now it's like a mega hyper jump, like love. Grab like press. Bring in the, since we're styling it, bring in the rib cage a tiny bit. And then the arms can be doing the whole Sailor Moon thing. <laughs> ah, it's gonna draw over the element, but okay. Ta da! Okay, so I'm starting to not feel very well. So I'm going to go take some medicine. So honestly, I think uh, that we can call it a night for tonight because it's been like a three hour stream already. And I hope you guys learned a lot. This one was a really fun one too. But overall, I'll put all these images on Instagram at some point or another with little lessons. And these will most likely make it into the book. So have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you all of you that interacted with me on the chat. You guys are awesome. You guys make my night so much better. So much better. So please ask questions. Interact with me. Send emojis. Like. Subscribe. Please subscribe. Because I need to get those numbers up on YouTube. Uh, if I can transfer everybody from Instagram to my YouTube, that'd be amazing. 
because then I could actually make a living with YouTube. But I would be up to you guys. Anyways, hope you all have a fantastic night. Have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful Sunday. And I will see you guys soon. Later.